Welcome to season two of the Art of Law podcast. Here with Lucky Lewis Harmon. With new lighting. Indeed. <laughs> um, and today we're going to be talking about equality, diversity, and inclusion. EDI. And EDI. whether it's the current frameworks are fit for purpose. And the whole thing is predicated on the fact that you've thought of a new legislation. I thought of new legislation. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you want me to start with that? Well, well, let actually let's start with the current legislation, the current equality legislation. Sure. The protected characteristics, mm. how it works, who it helps, and when. Okay. So, in terms of um, how it works, trying to put it as simply as possible, focusing on the highlight aspects of it. So, you've got your nine protected characteristics. Um, don't need to say them all out loud no. right now because I'll no doubt forget one, which will be embarrassing. But you've got your nine protected characteristics, which cover different aspects of people's biology or um, their internalized belief systems and various other factors of, of people's lives. So, for example, disability, gender, age. Age, sex, sexual orientation, and then some of the stuff that's a little bit more perhaps fringe or, or less, uh, a bit more abstract, like your marital status, um, belief and then religion, so some stuff that is intrinsically part of your biology, some that are part of your belief system and your spirituality, I guess. Um, it covers a wide range of stuff. So you've got these protected characteristics, and um, they've been around for a long time mm -hmm. now, but they have, because I mean, even though the Equality Act 2010 is 2010, most of these characteristics were cascaded across various other legislation before that, and then were just stitched together with new stuff added in. Um, and you've got those characteristics, and they are a bit of a an unequal paradigm. Um, some people have referred to the characteristics as having a uh, hierarchy of importance, mm -hmm. in the sense that if you're bringing a claim where you're saying you're discriminated against based on age or sex, it's usually quite easy to prove that you have a protected characteristic and prove which, sorry, sorry, where you fit within that characteristic. You know, if I'm if I'm a 31-year-old man, I'm male, and I'm 31 years of age. Mm -hmm. Easy. But on the other end of the spectrum, when you've got things like disability and you've got belief, they're under the eyes of the law equally as important as the other characteristics. But if you want to prove disability, you need to show you have a a physical or mental impairment that has a substantial adverse effect on your day-to-day -day activities. And you know what the law's like. That's mm -hmm. physical, mental impairment, substantial adverse impact, day-to-day -day activities. You've got six definitions to get through mm -hmm. before you can even prove that you have a disability. Same with belief. Belief has, um, the belief legislation is very empty. But the case law, the Granger and Nicholson case in particular, has given us a five-part test as to how you identify whether or not you have a belief that is worthy of protection. So you see what I mean? Some of these characteristics, if you want to prove you have them and you want to be protected for having them, you need to go an extra mile to get that protection, whereas with others, they're much simpler to deal with. So that's the starting point. You've got your characteristics. Um what the law really focuses on, putting it simply, is preventing people from being treated less favorably is usually the expression that's used. Not being treated less favorably because of that characteristic as compared to someone else who does not have that characteristic or is it somewhere else on the spectrum of that characteristic. Um, so it's really about, it's a preventative set of provisions. You should not penalize someone or harass them, or victimize them because of these things. It doesn't inherently lift those people or offer them um, enhancements or advantages. It's all about saying, no, you can't penalize or treat negatively because of those things. So you should treat those people the same as you treat everyone else. That's the, the idea behind it. The one exception to that really is um, disability, because disability does have the one positive aspect of um, uh, of protection, which is if you have a disability and your employer could make reasonable adjustments, so actually positive change to put you back on the level playing field, then they should. So I think that's 
that's probably the short version of what the Equality Act currently does, the characteristics, mm. and then the prohibited conduct do not behave in these certain ways, and then the little extra one for disability, which is mm. actually do that extra for those people with disabilities. That's the way it currently sits. And most prominently applies in relation to employment and public services. Those are the two we see. I can't actually remember how many other areas it fits into, but... Um, something that involves a public service or something that involves your employment, that's usually where we see the Equality Act come into play most often. Mm-hmm. So that's that's the framework to start with. Okay. So then, <coughs> as an employee, at what point am I protected? The whole time I'm employed. You are, well, you are actually protected from before then. Because it does protect you from the moment you're employed as long as you meet the Equality Act definition of employment. Employee, or actually, I think it's just employment under the Equality Act, which is basically if you're in the job. But the section 39 of the Equality Act also says that if you're a job applicant, so you're not allowed to be discriminated against even at the job application stage, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think we need to talk about that much further, but yeah, it does capture people much more broadly than perhaps normal employment focused legislation would. So, why is it not? Fit for purpose. Um, I'm not saying it's not fit for purpose. I just my personal view on it is that um, I think it's a little bit odd how over time we have cherry picked characteristics and slowly built up over time and added more and more on. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know we talk about sexual orientation and we talk about sex. And those have been around for a long long enough time now as protected characteristics. But now we have people who are trans who the law, I think, for a short time tried to loop it into sexual orientation, which is just not right. But, mm. I mean, it can form part of it. But it's really a thing about sex and gender identity. But then we have um, gender reassignment on our list of protected characteristics. And that expression is kind of gross now it doesn't really most people don't even use that expression really um but nonetheless the law is over time naturally pulling that in and saying right that's that's part of our selection of characteristics same with disability disability is starting to capture more and more recognized impairments i'm only using that expression because that's the expression in the legislation and it is being more and more inclusive of things that perhaps when the legislation was drafted wouldn't have even been on the radar but more recently, belief has probably been, I think, the most, I want to, I wanted to say problematic, but I don't think that's fair. It's the most unpredictable out of them. Because as I said before, belief under the legislation basically just says, if you have a belief, then it's capable of being protected. But the case law that's come after says, well, no, you've got to fit these five tests. And I can go, th- you want me to go through them? So I have to work out where I put my phone because, oh, there it is. So I opened it on my screen because I don't always remember every single step of the test, but I'll happily go through them right. So to have a philosophical belief under the Equality Act, you need to have a belief that is genuinely held. It must be more than simply an opinion or a viewpoint. It must concern a weighty and substantial aspect of human life and behaviour. It must attain a certain level of cogency, seriousness, cohesion and importance be some kind of actual material to it if you like oops and the belief must be worthy of respect in a democratic society not being incompatible with human dignity or in conflict with the fundamental rights of others that's quite a lot if you wanted to prove that you have a belief that is capable of protection in law you've got to go through a lot of stuff Mm. but it seems really weird to me that out of all of our protected characteristics that are relatively settled and well-defined now, we have belief there, which is very specifically worded as belief. If you have a belief that meets these tests, then Mm. you can be protected for it. But what I have been dabbling with and playing around with over the last few months is the idea of whether we take the word belief out of there and we replace it with identity or something similar to that because we are talking about things that are core to somebody which Mm -hmm. might not necessarily always be 
fairly captured as this is something I believe in. I'm not expressing that quite right. What I really mean is we will protect things at the moment if you fundamentally believe in something, Mm -hmm. but not if there's something more intrinsic to who you are as a person, the way that you behave, the way that you see yourself and realize yourself. If that's not a belief, it's not protected. Why wouldn't it be a belief? What scenario wouldn't what you're describing be a belief? So this may (coughs) seem a bit of a silly example but if you're someone let, let's just take this as a, as a very strange one if you're someone that happened to have been born into this life where for some reason you are abnormally tall let's take that you are abnormally tall and you spent your entire life being teased for it yeah mocked for it and Sometimes you might get the impression, um, and I appreciate I've just used the word impression there, but you might go through job interviews and sometimes feel like perhaps because of the way you've grown, you don't feel like you quite look the way that other people do in the room. You stand out and right. maybe some employers but that's, get the impression. That's all your, that's your problem so far. Mm, you so being far. The, you, you, being the tall, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. you being the tall guy. But so what what could I do to you? So if I didn't hire you because you were super tall, mm. the current protection, the current legislation wouldn't protect you. No. Well, because you, I could I could just not hire some big huge tall guy. Yeah. And the current legislation wouldn't protect you. If I fired you because you're just too damn tall, the current legislation wouldn't protect you. I can't see how I would, unless there was an underlying so then, condition that could meet the definition of disability. Yeah, 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 yeah. But let's imagine that's not the case. Let's just imagine it's poor Peter Crouch. <laughs> Right. That's who I had in my head. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so if that's the case, you're saying if, but how would that be identity? Him being tall is just him being tall. That's not. That's not something he's not choosing an identity. That's who he is. Mm. It is just who he is. Yeah. But that's the point. That it, is just who he yeah. is, and if it is just who he is. And it's a genuine part of who he is. Okay. So the, the so the, the but the trouble is is that what we what where we and this is, I'm just ha- this is happening now. Go for right? it. So it might not be. Yeah. yeah. Calculate it as you go. Right. I'll do the same. <laughs> but he's a super tall guy. That's who he is. Mm. Someone else is a hedgehog, and that's just who he is. Someone else is whoever he is. That's just who they are. And you're going to keep on having to go through some. Because the law's not just going to go, yeah, whatever. They're going to come up with a five-step program. To, so what is your identity, right? But why can't, instead of creating another category or, or of identity, and I appreciate I haven't actually let you explain your legislation yet, but instead of creating another category of identity, why can't I just not treat anybody badly? Why can't I just not hire anyone for any reason other than meritocracy why can't, why why isn't that sufficient that we could that, that you have a scenario where if i fire somebody for any reason other than his inability to do a job i get penalized mm. i have that tortious mm-hmm. space and this that and the other i have space why isn't that sufficient we don't have that i know but I th- we don't have that yet. We don't have but, that yet. But if you're going to start a revolution, I'm in. Mm. But if you're going to start a revolution, why isn't that where you're starting? Because I think if I understand what you're saying, you're saying a, a blanket kind of rule that you make your decisions based purely on meritocracy. It's based, almost like saying do everything blind so that you only yeah, make yeah. decisions based Just on merit. Just do it correct. Yeah. And Just I think, I think that, that's the way we're slowly moving towards with some employees in particular now lots of them are doing blind applications and blind assessments Mm -hmm. um but my point there is i agree with you i agree with you Mm -hmm. having a protected characteristic that captures a lot more of the human life human experience human physicality and protects that as something you can't be treated less favorably for as well means that employers will be pushed more to only make their decisions based on the merits of the applications, the merits of the skills and qualifications of the person. And it means there's less, because at the moment we do, like we said earlier on, there are these little little spaces you can reach out and go, well, you know, 
there was nothing wrong with their their sex or their age or their sexual orientation. They're just uh, they were they were really tall and they look a bit they looked a bit odd. You can't really do anything with that at the minute, but you potentially could with something that looks something like what I'm discussing, which means then employers go, we can't even we can't even think about going down that road because it's not fair. It's just fundamentally not fair. So let's reel back from that and say, look, we look at the applications because the risk is if we don't, we could have. Well, belief's an interesting one. But well, belief is... has. Belief is an interesting one because people make uh, adaptations for religion, but that's not under the law. Well, I suppose it is, isn't it? What do you mean? Do universities have an obligation to provide a prayer space? I don't think that they have an obligation. I haven't looked into it. Then that's fine. But most of them just do it as a matter of... As a courtesy. Yeah. Mm. Because, again, it's not a disability, so it doesn't have the positive... Obligation part. Obligation. But nonetheless, many people will... Sorry, many universities do have chaplaincy services, Mm -hmm. multi-faith chaplaincy, but equally... They have multi-faith chaplaincies where they have a range of different faiths. They never have all of them because they can't. And if, if the if the Section 20 reasonable adjustment rule applied to religions, then people would be say be able to say, well, you should at least see if you can get a chaplain's chaplain that meets my faith needs. But you know, universities aren't required to do that. But they do do a lot of work to make it happen where they can. Mm. And in some cases they'll have chaplains who are of a particular faith and will also champion certain others. The religion one, I think, to be fair, religion is quite well defined and understood under the law now. I'm not saying it's protected perfectly, but at least people don't tend to have as much trouble with the application of the religion uh, section 12 characteristic. Um, but it's belief which is captured in the same section because religion and belief kind of sandwiched together. Um, it's the belief one that has just slowly ballooned. And we've had cases, you know, on vegetarianism. And, you know, I can't remember. There was a case, I think it was called something like Kasimajan or something like that. It's got, I should, probably shouldn't have even tried to say the name, but there's a case involving different people with what on the face would look like dietary needs Mm -hmm. and they've said well you can't treat me less favorably because of those um because of those and 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 what scenario was this employment scenario yeah 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 Uh, how were they being treated less favorably they were being treated less favorably i believe it may have been because they were i may get this wrong it's been a while since i looked at it i think it may have been because someone was a protester and was were getting quite a lot of public attention because of their activity. Oh, because they were a, what a vegetarian. Well, protest. yeah, this is this is where I'll get a little bit muddled because there's been cases on vegetarians, there's been cases cases on ethical vegans, and the law has taken different approaches for different reasons. But um, that it's stuff like that that brings it into the spectrum, or in cases more simply where someone's at work and you know they have a vegan section of a buffet laid out for them by their employer and someone starts to berate them and harass them and say, you know, what on earth would you be eating that for? Just have a cocktail sausage like the rest of us and that kind of thing. And you think, well, I'm not, why am I being treated like this just because I eat different foods to mm. what you do? So that there's mer- various different ways where that comes into it. It's not always as big as I've lost a job or I've not been offered a promotion. Sometimes it is a case of my peers are treating me appallingly mm. because of this and i've raised the position i've raised the situation to mm. management yeah. and they've not dealt with it and the and the tribunal has had to really agonize over this because they apply the five part test and for example with this may have changed now but there was a time where there was a vegetarian case where the tribunal said well no that's not a protected belief because that's just a dietary. So you're, it's okay for us to bully you for the for the workplace to allow you to be bullied because it's not a protected belief. It's See, this is the point. So it can't, we come back to you can't treat people badly mm. for any reason other than well, you can't. It's not, I'm not saying you're allowed to bully people just because they're crap at their job, but you get the point. But then that then we don't have to go through the five part test. They were they were being bullied at work. Who cares why they were being bullied at work? If you didn't do something about it, smack on your wrist, penalty, cash. Here you go, veggie. Oh, I see. Go and buy yourself some. So your point is coming back to your idea. 
Yeah, mine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no. No, no, I get it. I get it. Um, I do see that. I don't know why... I don't know why case law hasn't moved in that direction already. Because the legislation didn't hampers us didn't to this structure, I think. Yeah. That's the point. We're working with the existing framework. And it is, it, with, I think with the belief stuff in particular, it comes out most prominently when it is interpersonal relationship issues. It's people treating each other stupidly. Um, that's when it's, of course, vicarious liability. It's treated as it's the act of the employer. Mm -hmm. So it's that stuff where these protections really come into the fore. But then if you think about your idea, is there's potentially the argument that if you have just a blanket, you do not make any employment-based decisions or um, or treatment of colleagues. No, I have to phrase that badly. You know what I'm saying? You don't make decisions about people's employment, nor do you treat employees in any way other than based on merit. You know, it's, it's mm. something like that as a blanket rule. It's a great rule. It's a great rule. But then that means the employers become vicariously liable for everything. They should be. If there's bullying happening in your workplace and you haven't done anything about it, it's your problem. I don't care that the person... The person doesn't have to be disabled for you to be bullying them. No, no, no. No, no, no. Just stop it. You should have stopped it. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's on you. Sorry, I, I don't, I don't want to upset everyone, but you should have stopped that. <laughs> no, and I, a little I bit of hazing on the on on the work site, no problem. But <laughs> beyond that, no, you should have stopped it. Mm. Oh, it's because the person wanted to dress up as a cat on the weekend. I give a shit. I care why. Just don't let the bullying happen. You know what I mean? Mm. A little bit of teasing, no problem. But bullying, when it becomes a problem, when someone's going home for, uh, every day upset, I'm like, oh, sorry, mate, that was on you. Yeah, go on, call your insurer, pay them out. I guess then the problem, because this is what I'm, this is what I was getting at earlier on, that we we start to cycle back round, because you made the joke maybe a little bit as a flippant joke comment, but the teasing, a mm. little bit of teasing in the workplace, the kind of banter that should be okay, and then we have to then go right now we have to draw Which up a line, banter. and yeah. section twenty six harassment mm. has already gone a long way to say no, this is what we don't allow. No banter at all. Well, no, it's not. No, no, no. I think the case law says that using, saying it is banter is no is no defence. Yeah, yeah. But no, yeah, the current obviously, law, obviously, because people put any. Oh, it's just bants. The no. current law is basically it's unwanted conduct. Let's, let's stick. There's three forms of harassment. But I'll stick to one. Unwanted conduct related to a protected characteristic, which has the effect of either violating someone's dignity, mm. or causes that person to be put into a offensive, degrading, humiliating, embarrassing environment. Mm -hmm. And you judge that, at least in part, based on the perception of the person who is the victim. Mm -hmm. How would that have looked to them? So at least the law has already thought that out. Mm -hmm. So at least there's some more hoops to jump through. There's safeguards. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of safeguard. Whereas with your idea, which at the top level I think is great, we then have to start to figure out how we build those safeguards around. Yeah, I mean... To get back to where we are. So this is why I said right at the very beginning, you said, why is it not fit for purpose? I said, actually, I think it is. But I think if you think about equality as a general principle, which is let's not treat each other badly mm. for stupid reasons. Let's just treat each other all as the same. And yeah, okay, we can, we can treat so each other So what is it we're trying to do, though? What is it? Because who, who isn't being protected with the current law? Are, are a lot of people not being protected with the current law? I think because I mean, I mean, I'm maybe I, I haven't, don't have experiences and an idiosyncratic experience isn't really that valuable anyway. But you don't really get. I just don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't, I don't see that I much don't of it. I suppose. Look at it from the perspective of who isn't being protected, because I think that's dangerous. Is it? I, li I don't like the idea of going, well, we need to move to capture that group because that's what we've been doing. Well, yeah, so that, uh, that, uh, that's not what I'm, that's not the reason I'm asking. I, I just want to know how big of a problem is it before we start this revolution? Do you know what I mean? I haven't, I haven't analysed it from the perspective of how big of a problem it is. But the way I look, I'll talk about where this came from yeah. for me. I was thinking about where are we heading with this? Where are we aiming to get to? Mm -hmm. And I think, most people that I talk to who move in kind of equality spaces in different ways, mm -hmm. 
will say that the idea is we eventually get to a point where we stop having to talk about any of it mm -hmm. because we all just as a matter of human nature go yeah we people. look different to each other we have different lifestyles get over it move on mm -hmm. that's where we want to get to right mm -hmm. and you think back to where the law was years ago and we really had you know disability discrimination legislation we had sex based discrimination legislation mm -hmm. and a couple of other pockets here and there and it slowly all amalgamated into this strange beast and i like the beast but i think We've been adding things on, and now things like menopause has started drifting in as a part of either its sex disability. or its disability mm -hmm. or its maternity. It's somewhere in between. That's the point is, why, why are we arguing about which one it fits into when what we're slowly well, doing that, is that, pulling that, enough that was in? slightly different because the reason that was, uh, that was slightly different because adjustments were required. Mm. So they want that, that was why that was pushed in or they wanted it to be in disability yeah. because they wanted section 20 yeah yeah protections that's that's i agree that's right but then my point more generally though is we have over time attracted in certain things but very specifically we have cut some things out too so for example in the legislation as it currently stands uh, i can't remember where it is now it might be under the race and nationality yeah the race and nationality section where you've got other other groups. I can't remember what the wording is they use now. But basically there's a power in the legislation to create more categories within that. You know, well should we look beyond skin colour and your nationality and your race and should we look more broadly at things like socioeconomic background and things like that. You know, if you're someone that's come from money and you're someone who's come from nothing, should you be allowed to be picked on and harassed because of that mm. and the law's kind of gone yeah fine fair play because if we legislate on that it's going to make things too complicated but then we'll put some other stuff we're going to we'll deal with that one but we won't deal with that one and i think that the logical conclusion to me is we get to that point where just everything is protected as long as it is a fundamental part of who we are which is where my idea of identity came from which i've had two different models for it one being that we just have identity just identity as a characteristic, which is more or less based on the Granger belief test. Mm -hmm. So you actually have to jump through some hoops. You can't just go, I'm this, I'm protected. You have to go, no, look, I, I can prove to you that this is a part of who I am. And if it's something to do with your physical body, like the tall guy we started with, okay, that's going to be easy to prove. How would a trans guy fit into that? Sorry, say that again. How would a trans guy fit into the Granger test? Right, so... because. Like with the gender reassignment thing, you know, it used to be two years and then you have to have mm. actually have the surgery and all the rest of it. And then you're like, okay, now you're protected. Mm. That was easy to prove because two years passed and you had the surgery. Yeah. But if someone just identifies as a female but has silently mm. gone through this concept, how Being are they supposed to go through perhaps. the Granger thing? Yeah. They're not going to They're yeah. not gonna pass the test. Well, they might do. I don't know. It depends. I mean, well, some asking, people will. Yeah, some people will, some people won't. And that's the way the law is now. But that's that not test. sufficient then. That's no, not, that doesn't Which protect everyone from a fairness point of view. Then. No, it doesn't. And I completely accept that as a as a criticism. Because if you go through the five-part criteria, you have to prove that it's a weighty and substantial part of your life and it's got cogency and it's a genuinely seriously held identity aspect for you. And that does mean that people who perhaps are newly discovering something yeah, or yeah, yeah. people who have closetedly hidden the but, aspects of their life, yeah, yeah. they get cut out, which is why... Um, my second idea, which is the one I prefer, is that identity is the umbrella term. So we kind of ditch the idea of protected characteristics as a label and we have identity is protected. And identity then has certain pre-recognized things that have been dealt with, which are the characteristics as they are now. So identity is protected, but identity does include, but is not limited to, da -da 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 -da, the existing stuff we've already figured out and defined mm -hmm. and we can work with. And then we take the word belief away and we replace that with the kind of catch-all concept of identity, which has the five-part test, but it's not limited specifically to belief. It's much broader than that. We open up the doors for more aspects of people's identity, their expressions, their personalities, their behaviours. We put that in and say, if you can show that you meet the tests, then you can be protected. And I appreciate it still will leave some people left out in the rain 
for a period of time. But mm. it shrinks the number of people because there are some people in it who won't even get a look in. The stuff we've been talking about, the extra tall people, the people you might um, identify as being a part of a certain fringe part of society, a group of society that most people don't even know exist, but they're there in their masses. They don't get a look in at the minute. Mm. They don't matter. They don't exist for the purpose of the quality law. But at least with this, <coughs> they have the chance to say, do you know what? I'm, I want to be able to be more open about who I am and express myself more. Without the risk of... Without the risk of being so openly so and wantonly abused for it. It's really tricky. It is tricky. But I, I, I because like even the Because fa- even the fairness... Yeah, even... Because the, fa- the, 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 the fairness model where we just say, just don't bully anyone for any reason ever. Even that model of it in employment law, you're like, oh, okay. I just won't tell you why I'm bullying you. I won't tell you why I fired you. I'll just manage you out. And the, what we were saying before, like you'd have to be an exceptional employee in that scenario. You'd just have to be an exceptional employee to be able to prove that it was for some other reason. Mm-hmm.